no worries. <laughs> no worries, used to it. How are you guys? Doing well. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. We may have a few more people jump on here in the next couple of minutes, but I want to be respectful of your time and Kyle's time. So I'll just do a quick introduction. So we have uh, Kyle McCaw here from Dallas, Texas, and he comes to us um, with what I consider to be a very extensive experience in dealing with both investors um, on the buy and sell side, also investing himself and generally just putting deals together. Um, and that, and Kyle, you can correct me if I'm wrong when I'm done, but I think that all resulted in him creating kind of a, um, an end-to-end -end investor experience from finding the lead opportunities to putting the deals together to sometimes being a partial investor in the deals um, and then uh, eventually realized the missing piece was property management. So now I think that's the biggest kind of feather in his cap now. And uh, we have a couple of property managers from our office on the line. But uh, I believe that you spend the majority of your time right now mostly doing property management and then working with a few of the select investors. So with that all said, I'm going to hand it over to Kyle. I also want to thank um, Mike Sunberg. For those of you that don't know him, he pops in every once in a while if you've had the chance to run into him. But he's in our office. He's an investor who has, Mike, how many properties do you have currently? Uh, currently 28. And how many did you have at your peak? 56. So yeah, Mike is a wealth of knowledge. I'm starting to go back up. I I'm just slow. <laughs> well, hey, it's hard to find good opportunities right now. So Mike's, uh, Mike's a great wealth of knowledge, though, in our office that at least since I've been here, um, we all haven't had a, a, too much of a public opportunity to talk to him. But if you're able, ever able to corner him in the office or reach out to him via phone, he's always more than willing to help. And he's actually the one that connected um, Kyle and I and uh, thought that it would be a good idea to have Kyle on. So thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And no um, with, with all that said, Kyle, the, the floor is yours. Sure, well, I appreciate the opportunity, Troy. It's uh, kind of neat getting to talk to somebody, particularly somebody in a different market. But uh, I'm one of those that always loves talking real estate. And I think that's one of the things that made me successful is that I always wanted to talk about it. And um, I think that's good information for any um, real estate agent, even if you're new and don't even know one type of granite to the net, I mean, to, to laminate tops, like whatever you feel like you don't know, don't worry about it, but always be willing to talk to people. because That's how people know that you, you're in the business. Um, so yes, that my property management is the big core business of mine. And I got into that business because I wanted the residual paycheck that it provided. But what I've I realized is it doesn't provide a residual paycheck, but I don't have clients. And so the way I got my clients, it, you know, it's hard to find because you go walk into a grocery store and every one of those people has a place to live for the most part. I mean, you know, they own a home or they rent a home. So they're potential clients in that regard, but having, which one of those own rental property, you have no idea. So I'm like, how do I get those clients into my property management portfolio? So I had to create clients. I had to help, help them buy investment properties and find them or educate them enough to want to buy. So um, that's kind of how I got started. I was like, I'll just help people buy rental properties so I can manage them. And I made a lot more money buying them properties and managing them. Um, so you kind of give up and get the big, big income hit when you buy the property, but then the little ones over time, but you get a lot of headaches with property management. But um, I threw it together, a little PowerPoint, just kind of give you an idea of, what if a new person came to me and sat down with me at Starbucks and wanted to know how do I start in attracting real estate investor clients and how do I service them? This is kind of what I'd, I'd point them to and help them out. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share a screen with you. And this is the first time I've done this. And I know I've misspelled like at least one word per page. So don't hold it against me. I can help people buy investment properties, but I can't help spell them. So let's see. Share. Okay, y'all see that now? Okay, good. So 
if I if I was fancy, I'd have little designs that would pop up whenever I wanted them to hit those certain topics. But what we'll start with is um, just attracting clients. It's different, so you have to. It's it's not a client that um, is what you're used to. So you got to remember they're coming from a different mindset. So you need to come from a different mindset also. And, and the mindset is is um, you just got to you, you kind of the way I put it here is you're not a real estate agent realtor anymore. I mean, you are technically, but when, when people ask me what I do, I don't think I've ever said I'm a real estate agent or I'm a realtor. My answer is almost always, I help people buy investment properties, primarily single family homes, or um, I help regular people. So I, that, and that, when I say regular, it connects to them, build wealth through rental properties. And those two sentences alone have gotten me so much business. And when you when you say I'm a real estate agent, they know what a real estate agent is. They don't. That's it. They know what a real estate agent is. But when you say I help people buy investment property to create wealth, that opens up a can of like questions. And they're and they're everybody wants to talk about the fix this house, flip this house, whatever on TV. Nobody wants to talk about real estate agent world. So it opens up conversations. And so it's just a trigger. So that's what you're looking for. You're wanting to connect with them by saying the regular people and then build wealth is what everybody wants to do. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, this is through Cub Scouts. Uh, I've got a, 11, a 12 year old son now. He just had his birthday yesterday, but um, I never go into the, I say I don't. I don't go into a conversation with somebody saying, I'm going to turn them into a client. I want them to know what I do. I want them to be intrigued by what I, I do. And I also want them to be intrigued by, I don't want to say the lifestyle I have, but the freedom that I have. And then, so they see something they want in the way I act or the way I present myself or maybe what I have. Um, so in Cub Scouts, we had a Cub Scout camp out, I don't know, wasn't even that long ago, maybe two, two years ago. And we're sitting out, um, the adults hanging out at the barbecue pit cooking. And uh, one of the gentlemen just asked what I did. And I told the same thing. I'm like, I help people invest in real estate, build, build wealth through that. I look at every one of my little rent houses as a little miniature 401ks. And then that was it. I didn't say anything else. And then they just started talking. Oh, well, so-and-so bought something and had a bad experience, good experience, whatever. Or, Man, it, and several times I've had somebody say, Man, I have a coworker that like just quit. It turns out he had like 50 rental houses that whole time. And, and so what happens is it, 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 it triggers a conversation for him. And that little conversation of maybe five guys standing around a barbecue pit, three of those became clients of mine within two years. One of them has five houses. Um, and he also became a real estate agent in my brokerage too. Another one bought a house and we managed for them. And another one, same thing. So I never asked them for business. What they usually do is after that conversation, I don't talk a whole lot. They come to me afterwards and like, hey, look, can we talk about this a little bit more? So you're, you're always trying to create triggers. And then if you see a little spark, certainly talk to them about it. But um, you just never know where they're going to come from. So don't be afraid to say what you do and then always put it in a way that triggers them to open up more of a conversation. All right, so this should be page two. So now remember, they're looking for something different than all of your other clients that you've ever had. Um, I call them better homes and gardens. Uh, people come to me and say, hey, I want to go buy, I, 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 we're, we're looking to buy a home. I'm like, that's awesome. I've got a great real estate agent for you. Here's Sally or Johnny or whoever. I, I tell people I don't do better homes and gardens. And when I say better homes and gardens, those are the homes that you're, you're proud to show. They're the ones that have like the beautiful curtains and the, and the this pristine tile and it's got, it's in the right neighborhood and there's Land Rovers in the, in the driveway and, <laughs> And that's not what that's not what we do. That's what we're, that's what our clients are not looking for. They're looking for ugly houses typically because they can make them look cleaner and prettier. Um, 
and they're looking for an investment, a return on their investment. So it's money. It's not emotional. I, I view the Better Homes and Gardens. That's an emotional thing. And that's why they got all the pretty pictures in their magazine. You don't see magazines of ugly houses for investments, really. Like it's So think of it that way. They're looking for something different. So take the emotions out of it. They're looking at, I have X amount of dollars and I want to make, do something with it. Um, so with that said, it's all about the numbers. You need to know your numbers. I'm sure y'all watch Shark Tank and, and somebody comes with a presentation of their business and those guys are always like, what are your numbers? And they drill it into them. Like, what's the cost? How, many, how much do you get out of it? Uh, what's this going to get me five years down the road? So you've got to know the numbers. And I'm going to tell you, everybody seems to be scared crazy when it comes to numbers. It like paralyzes people. You know, like people took math tests in high school and they froze up and they graduated and thought they'd never have to do numbers again. It's not hard. It's very simple, very easy. Um, you need to know what it's going to cost to get in it, what, what kind of cash flow they're going to get, what, what the expenses are going to be. And I'm going to show you a quick spreadsheet that I do for my clients in a, a one or two slides from now. So um, it's not that hard. So don't let that freak you out. So the next one is, um, keep in mind that real estate investors are look, there's four ways to make money in, in real estate in generally speaking, as far as rentals go. They are coming from a different point in life than most of y'all are. In some ways, they've already professionally made it. They, they, they got the income they need, but they're looking to maybe diversify their income, supplement their income. Maybe they got something else planned. So, Remember that what you think is good or bad is not what your client thinks is good and bad. So you need to really put yourself in their shoes. What are they looking for? Um, so the four ways that people make money in real estate, you're going to see this in the book that I'm going to recommend later, cash flow. Very simple. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of owning rental properties. They think, oh, I'm going to make $500 a month off of this house and that house and that house. And then you add them all up and then you're making tons of money. And that can be absolutely true. But I can't even count how many clients have come from, in my case, California. They fly into town and they go buy two or three houses and they don't care about cash flow. They're not looking for it. They're, they're putting a down payment on the house or paying cash. And they just want a place to sock some money away. And they're looking for the other things. They're looking for principal pay down. So if they've got a mortgage, every time that rental payment comes in, They've got a tenant that's paying their mortgage down for them. And so it's like saving for your retirement, but somebody else is doing it for you. It's the greatest thing. The, the appreciation bit, I never promise appreciation. I never tell somebody this house is $100,000 today, but in, it's going to go up 5% every year from going from now until believe it. Like I, I never count on it because you never know when you're going to have a economic environment that that puts pressure on prices that lower it or uh, you know so but i'll just say this is great appreciation some people really count on it but to me it's you know just i never promise it now there's two ways to look at appreciation and sometimes people break this out over time is like expecting to go up five percent per year for maybe five ten years the forced is when you see somebody buy a property that's Distressed. This is the ugly house. This is the typical fix and flip guy. This is the house that needs a new roof. It needs a hot water heater. It needs an HVAC. Um, it needs carpet, whatever. But you go buy it at a discount. You put those things in there, make it clean and presentable, safe and secure again, and you've created value. So I call that forced appreciation because you're, you're creating the value there. You're just creating it through your time, energy, and effort um, and money. And then depreciation. This is where your rich clients are going to be looking to you for help. And the, the depreciation, that is, you know, I've got a house, I buy it, and it, yeah, it goes up in value or stays in the same value. But just by owning it, I get to write a percentage of that on my taxes of the value every year. I think it's basically the, the value of the, the actual house divided by I think 27 and a half years. And that dollar amount is how much they get to write off in their taxes each year. So you have people that have W2 paychecks 
they love their rental houses because it offsets their earned income in a lot of cases. So you have straight line. That's what I just talked about. You're going to see that on that's that's what everybody that goes to the TurboTax.com. That's what they're going to get. Then there's something called cost segregation. A lot of CPAs don't even do this because it's just a lot of work and some charge a lot for it. But this is when people are buying a property and they're really turbocharging, putting their tax advantages on steroids. And so they'll take out lot, like different lot item expenses and shorten that uh, lifespan of the value. So they'll, let's say, I'm just going to use an example. If there's something that they put on a property that's only going to be good for five years. Maybe, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's carpet, but let's say it's carpet or dishwasher or something. You can take that and let's say it's $500 and you're going to depreciate it over five years. You can write off hundred dollars per year. So you're able to speed that up. So you're getting even more tax advantage. So you have a lot of people that are just looking for ways to uh, reduce their tax burden. This is what they're doing. This is why you see a lot of people buy apartment complexes and flip them every three to five years because they get all that tax advantages really heavy up front. And then they'll take that and they'll do a what's called a tax 31 exchange later. All right, so let's get back to the, the numbers a bit. This is what I send to my clients when we look at a property. This is a fourplex that I did in Fort Worth last year. Um, I did a little bit. These are the true actual numbers, but I ended up selling the property. And in, in my case, I didn't have to bring money down. So it was just pure profit. But this is kind of what you're going to show somebody if you're bringing them to, a, in this case, a, this was a fourplex or a house. You'll show them the market value. This is just an Excel spreadsheet. And you'll plug in the numbers. It's very simple. There's a lot of Excel spreadsheets out there that do this. So you're going to plug in all their expenses. And then this was kind of a, you know, the repairs and make readies, that's money that they had to put out of pocket to fix it up. There's some other financing. So we can have a class 2.0 for that kind of stuff. But what you do is you put their financing terms. I've got 20% down, 30 year term. In this case is four and three quarters. Now they're getting a really good deal. It's a lot lower. And then you, over on the right column, you see the, it's called the conventional outputs. That's if they're using conventional financing. So they're going to have a capital unrealized gain of $96,000 in value. That property is going to pay $30,000 a year estimated in cash flow. So that's a pretty good return on capital, 48%. What my clients, what I encourage clients to look at, they're looking for cash flow is the cash on cash return. In this, in this example, it's 15%. So for the money that I put into the deal, I'm getting a 15% cash on cash return. So and that's actual money in my pocket. So think of it that way. Then it just shows the different inputs on monthly rent. But this is just kind of an example of something to, to look at. Over here, the cash out of pocket, that's always important. And a client's going to want to know how much money do I need to bring to the table for this? And this is where it's really good to have some really good relationships with lenders. And when I say lenders, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Huntington, those type of banks, those are not going to be your banks that are really good for lenders or for real estate investors. You're going to be looking at a mortgage broker that specializes in rental properties. There's um, some small, smaller banks, community banks. They they love rental property. I've got a bank here that I use for my rental property. They won't lend me on my home. They don't do owner occupant homes. They only do investment properties, business business loans. Hopefully that kind of makes sense, but the general point is just give them something to show what they need to put into the deal and what they expect out of it. I usually give them a lot of pictures to go with it too. So again, going back to the think like an investor, this is, you know, read the books that they're reading because they're going to use terminology. They're going to say things that you aren't going to know what they're talking about if you haven't read or listened to what they have. So I really encourage you to start going to these podcasts for uh, Bigger Pockets is a good group. Um, the books that almost all of my clients have seemed to have read, because I ask them. One, Robert Kiyosaki, this is an, an older book. Um, it's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it really is it's just an, a book on how to view money. 
And the, the big takeaway is uh, the rich people buy assets and the poor people buy liabilities. And a, an asset is anything that puts money into your pocket and a liability is anything that takes money out of it. So the home you live in, he would describe as a liability because you're paying taxes every year to live there and you're paying the expenses to live there. But the rental house that he owns next door is an asset because he's getting money from it every year. Just a different way to look at money. I give this book to a lot of my clients when I meet them. And in the inside cover, I have a, a rubber stamp that says a gift of, or this is a gift from Macaw Property Management. So I just stamp it in there in all these books. And I give these to, to my clients. If they haven't read it, then I give them another book that I think will apply to them. Another good book is really going to teach you kind of where your mind, where the mindset is for your typical client. And I'm going to tell you right now that your typical client is not going to be the guy that's driving a Lamborghini down short north. Like this is the guy that's just hanging out with you in ripped up blue jeans. And this book that uh, Thomas Stanley put together, it was a research paper of who are the millionaires. And this is a little older book. I think it was the early 90s when it came out. But the, the millionaires, are they don't look like the stereotypical millionaire. And I'm telling you my clients, I have some crazy wealthy clients you would never know. Their neighbors don't know. Their, their kids in a lot of cases don't know how much they're worth. But what they did, they were smart with their money. They didn't, they lived beneath their means and they were savers. And a saver is a guy that's gonna have $40,000 for a down payment on a rental home. And that these are the guys that are like, I don't wanna have nothing when it comes to retirement time. So Millionaire Next Door and then um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad has a whole series that's good. Um, Stanley also has a second book called um, The Millionaire Mind. And I want to say that book really was kind of written for financial advisors on how do you get in front of millionaires. And so you, you go where millionaires are. So here's some other books and resources Bigger Pockets, I'm going to talk about that one a good bit. Bigger Pockets is a, it's a whole ecosystem. They've got a website, they have plenty of books. They have great books that you could give to clients. When you give a book to a client, stamp your name on the inside, say, hey, this is a gift from you know John, I mean, whoever, just do something for them. They're going to owe you something. If you do something for them, then they're going to psychologically feel like they're, they're obligated to you. Instead of going to another agent, they're going to go to you. Um, so any book within Bigger Pockets, any book in the Rich Dad series, there are many. Um, I would focus on the first two, um, Cash Flow Quadrant and Rich Dad Poor Dad, but then also they have several on rental property and the loopholes of the rich or loopholes for tax reasons. What some of that nature? It's a, it's an amazing book. It'll really open up your eyes on how to view your purchases too. Um, I bought my truck based off of tax reasons versus a, a smaller one. Um, Gary Keller, I mean, this is this is right up your alley. I mean, this builds credibility for Keller, Keller Williams agents when you're giving a Keller Williams book out. So millionaire real estate investor, I used to give this book to people too when I was a KW agent years ago. Another good network is realworthnetwork.com. Um, it's just another ecosystem with other like-minded investors. I've got a competitor of mine that she kills it with this group. Um, and she travels to them. She'll, she'll fly out to their events in California pre-pandemic. And then she's got all these connections of people that want to buy investment properties in Fort Worth. And I'm telling you, there's a reason why she's buying multiple beach houses right now in Florida. And it's because she's making the right connection, selling them houses. So another, and this just comes back to basic selling. Um, you can't sell somebody if you don't know what they want to buy or what they're looking for. So, so many of us, we project what we think they should buy on them. And in reality, we need to just provide what they're looking for. And so that's where you get, just start asking them questions. You know, why are you buying? I mean, there, there's people that are buying for so many different reasons and you aren't going to know unless you ask questions. So one of the things I've learned, and I'll, 
and this is funny, I learned this from when I was working with Mike Sunberg up in Columbus. I don't know if Mike, I told you, um, I was holding an open house on a house on a golf course for us. It was a really nice home and had a nice granite countertop, but I was a poor kid from East Texas. I'd never seen granite, so I didn't know what granite was. So when I was holding that open house, uh, I, I was walking around and I pointed like, hey, they got this nice marble countertop. And the guy looked at me, he's like, that's granite. I'm like, I believe you, I don't know. But that's when I said, well, I don't know anything. I, Mike's my boss. He's the guy that knows what he's doing. So, and, and you know, I think we got a listing off of that, that, that one back then. But the, the thing is, I've, lo- I've learned if I just keep my mouth shut and listen, they'll tell you what they want to buy. Um, so these are just a couple of things, retirement, future retirement, that can mean different things. They're looking for retirement income. It may be the home they want to move into when they retire. Um, current cash flow is obvious. Short-term buy and hold for profits. That's obvious tax write-offs. Some people buy houses in a college town planning to have their kid go there. I sell them what they want. I don't think that's the best plan. I think go buy another house that you know is going to be a great rental property and let that supplement wherever your kid's going to rent. Because he may go to another college, he may flunk out. Um, college houses have a lot more turnover, so there's a lot more wear and tear on those properties. Um, but the next one is huge. What criteria do you use when you evaluate a property? And in some cases, they will buy every house that meets that criteria, or at least let you offer it. And I, and I put a little note down here to remind me to tell you about two of my clients that I've had in the past. Um, one of them, I'm going to call him Mr. Barbecue because he owned a barbecue restaurant in Texas. And he was a gentleman, that he had some good cash and he watched that movie or those shows flip this house. And what he did was I met him at a real estate meetup on a Saturday morning. I went there to just kind of learn. I didn't go there to necessarily get clients, but I was sat down next to this gentleman and he was complaining to the people in, in the group before the group meeting started. And he's like, man, I can't get any real estate agents to call me back. Like I keep telling them I'm ready to buy houses. I'm going to go buy 10 houses and, None of them call me back or I'll have a conversation. They never send anything to me. They never take me serious. And then, so I, I just sat there for a little while and let him talk. And after he got finished, I'm like, well, um, Lynn, Lynn was his name. I was like, Lynn, you know, the thing is, is you're one of like a hundred people that have gone to them asking the same thing. You need to let them know that you are only going to work with them because what happens is they get burned by all these people that show up saying, I want to buy rental houses, but then they don't have the ability or the means. So you got to show them that you all, that, that you're the guy that is dedicated to them and you're serious and you're going to make it happen. That gentleman, I didn't ask him for the business at all, but he knew it was a real estate agent. He called me the next morning while I was at my normal job. And he's like, Hey, man, I was listening to what you I remember what you told me yesterday at that meetup. Can you, can you be my agent? Will you do this for me? I'm like, yeah, sure. And so what he did, and don't act out, out of desperation. I always say, I always, they almost think it's a, me doing them a favor, helping them buy properties. This gentleman, seriously, he gave me his criteria and I was busy. I had a, I had a nine to five job that was taking up a lot of time during the day. And that was the time he had off. So I had another agent in the office paired up with me. And what I did is, I had him set up to where he'd get an email blast. You know, y'all's MLS does it. Send him a blast for every property that kind of fit his criteria, price range, kind of the geographical area. I knew what they'd rent for. And then he would email me which houses he was interested in. And then I'd email him back some basic showing information. And then he would email me an offer price for each house. Because I told him, we're making an offer on every single house. I don't care if you want it or not. Every one of these is getting an offer. Now, you don't want it very much. It's a low, low offer. And so it's a good deal. And if it's something you really want, it's all right. So he just send me a number next to each house he's, that we got information on. And then I would just forward that email to a guy in my office, Rodney, and Rodney would do all the paperwork. And I just told Rodney I'd pay him X amount of dollars for every house that closed. I did nothing. Like all I did was do those three or four emails back and forth and then collected that check. So if you just give them what they want, like they just need somebody to help them with the transaction sometimes. This next one's a private equity company. This is when 
you know, the market tanked and we had all those foreclosures hitting the market. Well, there, there were plenty of private equity funds that were out there trying to buy houses. And so I got hooked up with one. And the way I got hooked up with one is I sold a house to them. And then, so then I knew who was buying for them and I reached out to them and then I was able to get hooked up with them. And they sent me a criteria. I did some training for them. They had an Excel spreadsheet. They said, this is what we want to offer. Every house that fits this criteria, send it to us and we'll send you back a number to offer. I did, and then we bought a whole bunch of houses for them. It was that easy. It was, it was easy. I mean, these two examples were dozens and dozens and dozens of houses that from, from two clients. So remember when you're looking for an investor, they may buy multiple houses off of you. That private equity fund, I wanted, I didn't get, I was not their biggest client or biggest agent, but I was only one of four in DFW for them. And I, they bought hundreds of houses and they only bought through real estate agents. And they bought through real estate agents because they realized real estate agents were kind of a fiduciary responsible, had a fiduciary responsibility for them. And they felt like buying off the MLS was safer than buying at the auction or buying off market. So going into where do you meet your investors? Because, you know, like-minded people are around like-minded people. So just a few areas that I've found clients, uh, self-directed IRA meetups. Now it's a little different than what you're thinking of in general terms of IRA. It's self-directed is, where they can put rental properties in their IRA. Is it the best investment ever in an IRA? That's not for us to decide. They want, an, they want a house, we'll give it to them. Um, so we'll help them buy their house, put it in the IRA. Those are also great places to find lenders that do private money lending because they put money in these IRAs and they want to lend it out in private money notes. So they'll be your mortgage company instead of the banks. They have different lending criteria. So it might be a really great place to go to get money. If you're a real estate agent, you probably don't have a W-2. Banks don't like you. I hate to break the news to you. But these self-directed IRA people love you because, I mean, I've got houses that have interest rates from three and a half to 5% interest, which is not bad. But these are all from private money notes that people, they would rather lend money on a house that they know is solid and is not going to go anywhere. Nobody's going to air up the tires and roll them away. But um, if they put that money in a mutual fund or stock, it may go down 20%. They have no control over it. But with the note, they get that 5% direct deposit every month and they think that's the best thing to slice bread. Um, bigger pockets. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide in real much more depth but this is a great place to go to meet investors. This is where people are going to learn about real estate investing. Um, local meetups. I put that it's full of wannabes because it is. I've, I've gone to hundreds of these things and, and there, it's full of kids that want to make a million bucks in real estate by next weekend. And it's not full of investors, but you can find them. I mean, they're going to be in there. But your investors, you know, these, these meetups are usually on Thursday nights or Saturday mornings. Well, you know what? My clients, they ain't going anywhere like that on nights or weekends. They got families. They're, they want other things to do with their lives. But um, you'll find them in those meetings. Um, mailing non-owner occupant properties. I've had great success with this. And what I've done is I would, you know, being a property manager, real estate investor, or real estate agent, I would pull a list of properties that fit a certain area, a criteria that I'm looking for, 322, brick on a slab, certain zip code. And I'd say, hey, on this postcard, I make it very simple. I'm interested in your property. Now, this you might have a different spin on it, but my, my email or my postcards say, hey, I'm here to solve your real estate agent or your real estate problem. If this house, if you're looking to sell it, I'm looking to buy, or I can be your agent. Either way, I'm going to take care of you. And I've, that, that's that been my biggest thing on it. I've, we did a postcard mailing this last week. We sent less than a thousand cards out and we had seven people respond, which is obscene. That's a crazy number. 
I don't know if it has to do with the pandemic, but that is an obscene response rate. So probably going to buy a couple of properties off of that postcard campaign. Postcards are cheap. Um, just and keep mailing them. Just keep mailing them. Um, and you'll find people that, you know, estates, they need to sell their house. You can list it, give them top dollar. Um, special topic events. These are really overlooked by agents. So I just got a phone call this morning from my title company. I use a lot and they're putting on a special class on 1031 exchanges. That's a great place to meet people that are buying and selling investment properties because what happened at 1031 exchange, I haven't mentioned it. It's where you have a, a property. Now you can do it with different things, but this is, let's say it's a single family home. And let's say they bought it for a hundred thousand and they wrote off everything they possibly could on taxes for a few years. They paid down the mortgage sum. It's gone up in value. Well, they got this, maybe it's, maybe they have $80,000 in equity in this property now. Well, if they sell it, what happens? The tax man wants to pay. Well, that's a big tax hickey. But the cool thing is, is all these jokers that are in DC, they have their money in real estate. And what they figured out, they gave us this loophole where you can sell that house and not pay the taxes on it if you roll that, that, that gain into other properties. That is a gold mine. So I've got an agent in my office. She has five listings right now of rental properties that the owners are selling. And I've been trying to get her to get onto the 1031 train because what happens is each one of those is gonna have a tax that you wanna sell if they don't reinvest. But this is a great place to target people that have equity in their home. Say, hey, you may not want that tax hickey, but let me show you a way to double up your investment income and not get hit on your taxes. So what they do is they ideally would sell that house and buy two more. So Heather in my office, if she were to list one of those houses and sell it and take that money and buy two more houses, that went from being a one transaction, one commission into three commissions. Three commissions off of one client, not bad. Not bad at all. Um, let's see, uh, landlord, landlord lecturing lectures, asset protection, asset protection, local attorneys. Like I just did a podcast with some attorneys here in town that they just do a lot of real estate agent, or they do a lot of real estate transactions and so go listen to them, talk to them, meet with them, let them know what you do. Let them know you're smarter than the other real estate agents and start, stuff will start flowing to you. Um, the landlord lectures, I went to one a few years back and I didn't get a whole lot out of the class, but I, I ended up buying a property off of the guy that put on the class and Ironically, he didn't understand how to make that property profitable, but I guess I did. So we turned it in and made a great deal out of it. And he, he still talks about how I kept him from losing a whole lot of money on a house. I bought the house and made money on it. He just didn't know how. But the point is, is you're, you're going to meet people that, are, that have deals that you can be involved with. Rehabbing classes, help people put their houses top market, put on the MLS forum, what have you. Um, Networking again, general contractors, hard money lenders. Don't want to go into too much detail with that, but that's a special lender that lends on distressed properties that wouldn't qualify for bank mortgages. The right mortgage lenders, that's not your Bank of America mortgage guy. That's your uh, community bank lender or a mortgage broker that specializes in that. Title companies, great. Insurance agents, I've gotten a lot of properties off of insurance agents, you know, client dies, they need to sell the house. Um, they're want, they're wanting to buy another house. They need to buy a house. Either way, that's that's a good place to go. And I know I'm probably rambling a little while. We're 42 minutes into this. Okay, so going back to bigger pockets. Bigger pockets is my gold mine. So all of y'all can go out to bigger pockets. All of you can dig it like crazy and you'll all come up with a lot of gold. So it's not like you're competing against each other, even though you are. So this is where people start Googling how to buy investment properties. And they get in here and they start going through all these forums. People post things. So what I do is I go in there and I post on topics or I answer people's questions. You're like, 
this person happened to ask about investing near Texas Christian University. And so I just gave an answer of kind of why I'm not really sold on it. And then this is what I look for. Now the bottom. But what's important is I've got this second level up membership. I have a pro account. The pro account, because they do not allow you to self uh, promote in here. So if I said, oh, talk to me, I'll help you buy a better property, they will, they'll, they'll just delete my post. But if I have that pro account, every time I post at the very bottom, you'll see it's got my name, my phone number, my website, all of my information. So I'm self-promoting like crazy, but I'm doing it within their criteria. Other thing is on messaging. So you'll see somebody that has something that they post in bigger pockets. You can relate to them by connecting to them, or you can directly post them, instant message them. And so what happens is when you start posting, people start recognizing you because they're looking up Columbus, Ohio, and they're all of a sudden they post, they look up Columbus, Ohio, and they're like, well, crud, man, this guy must really know his stuff. He's like all over this bigger pockets. And so they think you're an expert. No, you're not an expert. You're just a guy that had no business and he had tons of time. So he just posted like crazy on bigger pockets, but they don't know that. It's just perceptions reality. So in this, this case, this is a dude in California. I've never met this guy. And as you can see, he, he just directly messaged me and said, hey, this is what I want. I mean, how many of y'all would love to have a client just come to you? You've never talked to him. And he's telling you, hey, this is what I want. Can you help me? Like everybody wants that. This was just from posting on bigger pockets. I didn't, it's evergreen marketing and it didn't cost hardly anything. So great resource. This is another thing you can do in bigger pockets is you can set up your account to notify you whenever somebody mentions certain topics. So my topics, are, the first four are pretty boring. As you can tell, I'm looking at buying a Disney World. But, you know, if somebody mentions Fort Worth Property Manager, Fort Worth, Dallas, um, investing, I've lived in different neighborhoods listed on my criteria, it'll notify me. So what happens when they, I'll just go in and respond to their question or their comment. So what happens is I know somebody that's interested in Dallas because he posted about Dallas and then I start talking about it. This is like the biggest kept secret in, in real estate investing. Like it's, there's so much money. This is the biggest driver for new business for my business right here. Um, Cause I don't, I'm short on time. Self-directed IRAs. I know that's usually a topic that people have no idea what we're talking about. So I just threw up a couple of examples of companies that do this. And I typed in Columbus, Ohio, self-directed. Equity Trust, I know does them. Uh, this company, GBQ, I saw it was Columbus based and it looks like they have events. Just go to those events and learn about it and, you're, and you're, you're good, you'll come up with business. That's all I got, show's over, I guess. But So tell me what you got on questions. You know, did you love, hate my presentation or have specific questions or? If, if you guys want to put your questions in the chat, unless you want, I mean, you can also say it if you want, but either one works. Um, and then we can go from there. I will kind of what we were thinking uh, with regards to questions, there's probably going to be a lot of detailed questions like about self-directed IRA and things like that. I think we're going to do a whole separate class on that. And I'm sure Kyle would probably be able to talk to anybody offline who... Sure you know, really wanted to jump right into it. But um, we'll go ahead and I guess whatever you guys have questions on, we can maybe add to in a future class. Who was talking? Was that you, Teresa, when I interrupted you? Go ahead. You can say it out loud if you want. Okay, I just typed it. I'm a slow typer. I have two questions, but we'll hit one. Hey, Kyle, that was really good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The Excel spreadsheet, when you're working with the investors and you make the Excel spreadsheet, can you just give me some examples of criteria? I mean, other than price, what, what are some examples that you would have on there? Well, you can have, you know, if they have an HOA expense, you know, it's going to be something that pops in, the potential rental income. So you'll want to be really good on your uh, rent comps, you know, like put that as your expected income. Um, you're going to have your tax taxes. You're going to put that as an expense. 
You're going to put in, um, depending on the property, like how much maintenance might be needed. So if it's a brand new house, man, you might not have to put much in for maintenance. But if it's a rough house built in the 40s that needs a lot of work and your guys aren't going to do a lot of work, you're going to need to put in some estimate for maintenance. So do your investors just say like, hey, we don't, we don't want any taxes that are more than 8,000 a year. HOA can't be more than 200 a month. Is that how specific they're getting? Um, not as much on the taxes. We have a, a much higher tax rate for, for real estate here than where you are at. Um, we have people say, I don't want HOAs. And I think that's a, that's a dangerous assumption for an investor to say they don't want. Um, and what they, and, and I understand why they say it. they don't want that expense. They don't want somebody telling them you can't paint your fence a certain color. But what I tell them is like, that's true. But think of them as an HOA is protecting the value of your property because it's telling the neighbor that they got to take the, the car out of the front yard and things of that nature. So sometimes it's worth it. Um, but yet they, they usually want a, Everybody's different. A lot of them will say, I want 1% per month. So I want to pay, for example, $150,000 for a house and I want to rent for 1% of that per month. So 1,500. It's really hard to meet that in a good neighborhood now here. So I tell them maybe it's 0.8%. So sometimes we'll get that. Cash on cash returns is also an, an important number. Um, but usually what we're looking at is 322, brick on a slab, in a neighborhood you don't mind walking at night. And I tell people, I use this story all the time. You want a house in a neighborhood where your tenants move in, their kid becomes best friends with the kid next door, their, their boy is playing flag football with the kid down the street, their Christmas tree's in the attic, their bicycles are in the driveway, they ain't moving. Like they don't move. Like you want tenants to move in and never want to move out. And so that's what I always tell my tenants or my, my clients is you want houses that people don't want to move out of because the terms are expensive, the downtimes is expensive, and you want somebody that's that, that's going to live there and take care of your home. Okay, good. I hope that answers it. It answered it really well. Last question, really easy. And I know everybody will roll their eyeballs, but sorry, I don't know the answer to this. When you were talking about mailing to the non-occupied non-owner occupied properties how do you figure out other than do you have to get on the auditor's website and look that up or how does the person find that out sure so there's two ways I, I find them here now you can pay for lists but i don't like paying for stuff so in my mls system and i'm not sure about yours our mls here you can go in and search the tax rolls for houses that are let's say 1500 square foot 1600 square foot whatever but there's a little option in there. And I'm, I tell you, there might be 300,000 real estate agents in DFW and 15 might even know about this, but you can change your criteria to what you want and you can, ex you can export that data list from my MLS. And, and that, that's your answer. It gives you all, it gives you their mailing address for the taxes, which that's where they live. And then it tells you the subject property, which is the real house you're looking at. Um, and that, that's, I, I can tell you, I did one postcard alone that nailed me three property management accounts. Well, one, he it was a guy that owned them. He lived in California. I told him I'd go look at his house, see what it looks like, just as a be nice thing. I went over there, showed him the pictures, and he was horrified. So he paid me to fix it up and then list it and sold it. And so he, and then he did two more houses also. So um, where do you find it? That's one place your MLS might have an option to export data, but you might have to tinker with it. The other thing is go to a title company. Yeah. Title companies want your business and they can run that stuff for free. I can't remember the name of the programs. They all have different programs. There's like four or five. White Knight, I think my, it's something Knight, Black Knight. There's a, there's a database that uh, title companies have access to. They can just pull data for you. Thank you. Sure. Rebo Gateway is another company that you can pay to find those resources. You'll also be able to find uh, recent divorce filings, estates, um, evictions. Rebo Gateway, I think is the name of the company. 
but it's just a pay service. You go in there and put your criteria and they'll give you all the data that you want for like a few dollars. And, you know, statistically estates, they sell those houses within two years. I think 90% of them sell within two years. So that's a great resource. To hey, to. Kyle, I have a quick question on, um, so when you were talking about the best things to ask an investor, um, number one, what are the best one or two things to ask an investor when you first meet them? And then what are the one or two things that you're listening for to figure out whether they're an imposter or a real investor? There are a lot of imposters. So ask them, you know, are you paying cash? And when you say cash, that can, if they, if, if you see a flinch a little bit, you, you, that you can catch the imposters that way. Cause if, if they, if they're going to pay cash, like that's a non-event for them. But if, if, if it's a legit buyer, they're going to already have their financing and depending on the type of property they're buying, they're going to have different types of financing. Maybe it's hard money or if it's traditional. Um, so you'll want to get, you know, how are you planning on purchasing? That should be one of the top ones. Just like you wouldn't go show houses for some joker that rolled up in a beat up car and you're showing them half million dollar houses. Like you would, you want to approve of funds. So same thing with a real estate investor, like, hey, how are you financing this? Or are you paying cash? And if they don't show you it, we don't even bother with them because there's, there's like, hey, I can't help you until I have this because nobody's going to take your offer serious, period. And I've got 15 other guys like on hold waiting for me to help them. So you need to do this for me, provide screenshots of bank accounts. I sent one this morning for somebody that's screenshots of bank accounts, close houses, just black out, you know, the address and the, and, and the account numbers. And when I go buy houses, I don't show the, Oh, I can qualify by hard money and cash flow. Show them a bank statement. And it, I mean, hell, it doesn't even have to be yours. It has to be somebody you have access to that'll lend you the money. You just black out the, the indicative data. And then they're like, Hey, I know you got 15 offers and all these people said they could buy your house. Here's the bank account that the money's coming from. So we have it. We don't need this. So inspection. That's, a lot of people, you don't, I know you want to do inspections, but that's what's going to close houses is buying as is where it is cash. So as far as top questions, how are you going to fund it? And then get the proof of funds. Those are the most important. And then what are you looking to accomplish? And then that alone just opens up everything. And, and you know, the fakers, they weed themselves out just on that first question about financing it. Perfect. Andrea asked, um, what's the best way to run uh, rental comps? Okay. I'm not sure about your market. So in Texas, in DFW, my MLS that I'm in, real estate agents put rentals in it so I can get rent comps. Other markets that I'm in, they don't. So that's a tough one. So you can, you can do a lot of digging around on Zillow and hot pads and all those to find what properties rent for if mm -hmm. you don't have access to that in your MLS. But um, since I'm not in your market, I would not be the best one to answer. But I, I pretty much go off the MLS. I would say, Mike, I'd be curious on, on what your answer is to that. Maybe you only buy it in areas that you know them off the top of your head. But I would say, even though the MLS doesn't have a ton of rent comps, there's usually enough if you look back one or two years and include canceled and expired that you can get a pretty good range. Um, and then also, uh, like, like he said, Zillow, um, or even Craigslist can also just kind of, um, bolster and give you a few more comps. It, like maybe if you only had one or two in the MLS and usually to remember, I think one of the mistakes that agents make, and Kyle and Mike, I'd love to get your feedback on this, but I think when people are doing rental comps, they try to act like it's a sale comp. And you have to remember the last time you rented a house, like you weren't as concerned about the house backing up to a busy street or the train tracks, maybe the train tracks, but like there's a lot of things that buyers when they're purchasing a home care about when they're a renter, it's not. 
So, you know, even though like for a buyer, the difference between Lewis Center and Olentangy versus Powell and Olentangy could be a huge issue, but for a renter, it's not going to be, maybe I said renter before, but for a purchaser, that's going to be a bigger issue usually than a renter who's only looking to stay in the house for one year. What you said is so important. I can't tell you how many real estate agents bring us houses to manage and they're so far off on their rental expectations uh, because they didn't, they, they're running the rental comps based off the square footage of the house. And my tenants, they're looking for number of bedrooms first and baths. If it's got a extra square footage that happens to be in like a little nook or a, a larger closet, that's not going to get you the same increase in rental rate because they're going to see the house two, two down that rented for, you know, $1,600 a month, but you're wanting 17, but it's, the only difference is, is you got a little nook, like they're, they don't, they're going to go for the 16. They're going to always, so it is very important not to get hung up on running comps with the same mentality as, as buying or selling a house. So it's more off of square footage, year built and interior condition than it is square footage. So what you said with your MLS not having rental comps necessarily, that actually makes you more valuable because that they're not getting those comps from anywhere else. So if you know the neighborhoods, that's going to help. Uh, talk to a property manager that doesn't buy and sell houses. There's a lot of them out there. Some of my best client, my best referrals come from real estate agents and they'll shoot over. We just say, we don't, we aren't going to sell houses to your client. And they'll send over a house. There's like, Hey, we're looking to buy this. What will it rent for? And then somebody in my office will, will tell them, Hey, we got a house in the same street. This is what we rent it for. And here's some comps and they'll send it to them. So talk to a property manager, be buddies with a property manager, especially one that doesn't buy and sell. And there are a lot of them that don't. Awesome. Uh, Patrick Flynn asked, have you ever used rentometer.com? Yes. And at times it's good. And at times it's not. Um, there's rentometer. And then there's one other firm that, that that's what they do. They do a good job in general. So yeah, it, it's a good, good program. Yeah, Bigger Pockets actually has. I, I think it's pretty new, so I'm not sure how built out it is, but they're starting to do that a little bit too. It's on their website. So you got to take those with a grain of salt because sometimes they're not like they're way off. I'm trying to see what that, there's another company too that does have, something similar that really breaks it out. Yeah, Patrick, I actually just use Rentometer because I have a place coming up. Uh, one of my rentals and I was just curious about it and um, the the pro reports that I think they give you five or six for free but they get pretty detailed um, I think you always have to do your own digging though because obviously it's all AI and so sometimes like on this one in particular like mine's a house and 90 percent of the comps were apartments and so like they weren't really factoring that in too much because they didn't have enough house comps um, so I think you have to do a little bit of your own digging, but in terms of, you know, getting a decent idea and like Kyle said, I mean, if you have an investor that's willing to buy five or six houses from you, what's paying for a subscription to that? It's like, I think the, the minimum subscription is like 40 bucks a year to be able to go in and at least get a range for them, you know, right off the bat to be, and give them the low end of the range um, but it pulls the comps and w at being a real estate agent, you can look through pretty quickly and figure out like, you know, based on the, the bedrooms, like Kyle said, but definitely bedrooms are the big, big, don't get caught up in the square footage game with rentals. Yeah. Uh, I think they have a really good report too, that you could give. And I want to, you might be able to white label it with your logo on it. If I remember right, or at least. I think if you may. Yeah. So that might be some value add that, the other agents aren't doing is have a white label version of that. Mike, what do you use? Well, as far as uh, looking for the uh, rental comps, rent, rent market, pick up the phone. Um, if, uh, if there's a, if there's a property that I have or one that I'm looking at, 
I'll start with the MLS just to get a, a quick sense because a lot of the stuff I look at is fairly unique. Um, to get into apartment buildings uh, is very different than getting into houses, but um, generally just, you know, pick up the phone. Like if I'm in the campus area, it's fairly easy. You just pick up the phone and go, hey, I've got a kid looking at Ohio State. That's the place to start. Um, it doesn't take any time at all to start to figure out what people are renting things for. Um, I used to get on the lantern back in the day when they used to fill all that in and I'd see what was there. I'd see what was on Craigslist. Um, in other areas, uh, it can be a little trickier, but you know, if I'm looking at a targeted area, say I'm looking north of 161 and just east of uh, say 71, for example, um, there's some nice pockets in there, but if you, if you see signs, you know, I used to drive along with, a with one of my partners and he'd just get on the phone and call and we just keep driving and that would build up some sense. Um, so, uh, but I think, I think what Kyle had mentioned, uh, probably the best, best scenario is you look for, but. Don't be afraid to talk to neighbors. Don't be afraid to, you know, that's kind of the thing. It's, it's getting out there. I have one business partner uh, now. Um, he's in financial planning, but he'll talk to anybody. All the neighbors of all our properties know him. They have no, no idea who I am. They're just thinking some strange dudes walking around in front of a house. But my business partner, they got his number. I know um and that's that's not a bad thing so, so yeah talking to people is not a bad thing i think i think too that's a great point though with the mls comps if you if you go in pay attention to the agents go back three or four years in that area and even though some of the comps from three or four years ago won't be there but if you look at the real estate agents that are listing those rentals Usually if somebody's listing a couple rentals in one area, they probably have a lot more that haven't been listed on the MLS or they at least have, are more experienced with that area. No one else is calling, asking them this stuff. So I've found that agents, like even if you just shoot somebody a text or an email, a lot of times they'll get right back to me. Oh yeah, I rented that last one um, for blah, blah, blah. I also found that... Um, Agents don't always update the rental listings as often as they would a sold property. So a lot of times they'll be in there and it'll look like something sat on the market for, you know, three months without renting. And then you text them and they're like, oh, that rented like two and a half months ago. Sorry, forgot to market. Um, and then also on campus and areas like that, they'll advertise stuff for months before it's actually, and I actually texted one this morning um, I just have a listing up at Polaris and had an investor call me and the one that's on the market, he said, well, the tenants not moving out until March and they won't allow any interior showings. And so like, even though it's been on the market for 60 days, um, it's not really a true representation because they haven't been able to do any walkthroughs. So you do have to do a little bit more digging around those rental comps because if you take it at face value, like you do a sale comp you're probably getting bad information. Um, Troy, I think you're, you're spot on. As a matter of fact, there's one thing that you guys will notice. Um, right now with Zillow, you gotta pay to list a rental. So usually if you find a rental on Zillow, it's probably accurate. I highly recommend to take into consideration the condition of the property and where it's at, because that'll give you a ballpark of where it is. You keep focused on the number of rooms, number of bathrooms, and everything you get said so far about the mindset you're going in. But Zillow will give you accurate pricing. The other thing is apartment buildings. You're seeing them pop up everywhere in Columbus, especially those luxury ones. They do list their prices. And that will kind of, so let's say if you're looking up on the north side of Columbus, uh, Dublin, Sawmill Road, there's a lot of apartments there. You will see their listings, let's say we'll say for a two bedroom, one bathroom, $1,000 plus. That plus is obviously for the extra amenities, but that can give you a good baseline. You compare the condition of that property to your 
the property and that gives you a decent ballpark. The other thing is exactly what Mike said earlier for Linden or let's say Franklinton. I drive around, I see the signs for rent, pick up the phone, call, how much is it? Do you have any pictures online? You go in, you assess it, you compare it to what you have and you just go from there. And before you know it, you will know the market like the back of your hand. It really gets easier, very, very easy as time progresses. And every one of those people you call is a That's my two buyer. cents. Yeah, buy or sell their house. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you guys jumping on, Kyle. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, I appreciate it. This is fun. Yeah, you're uh, you have you have nothing to gain but creating relationships. And so we just really appreciate your time. And um, we look forward to doing more of these in the future. All right. Well, I, this, this is I enjoy this stuff. I'll talk I'll talk real estate to tree all day long. So Kyle, last question before everybody jumps off. If someone wanted to get a hold of you, um, are you on social media? Is email, phone? What's the best way for somebody to find you? Sure. So email's good. It's Kyle, K-Y-L-E, at mccawpm.com. That's a good one. Um, my cell phone, I, I don't even answer it anymore because it's too many scams, but you can leave me a voicemail. It's 817-559-3163. As far as social media, I'm on Facebook, but man, I've I kind of tried to get away from it. I mean, I'll, I'll, my business will post stuff, but there's too much hate. I mean, it's hate book now. I'm like, I deleted it for a while. And I was happier. And, um, you know, I, I choose to be happy. And social media is just not fun anymore. So you have a business page on there, though, that's somebody in your office is keep an eye on? Yes, yeah, so I've got a uh, gentleman that lives in Mexico that handles my Facebook. He's a great dude. Um, and he handles most of my Facebook posts and responses. And then um, I've got a few other little things I got projects going, but. Okay, cool. All right, well, anybody, if you guys need to get a hold of Kyle, his info's there in the chat and we really appreciate you uh, taking this time. Well, good luck. You There's a lot of money you made, go make it. All right, awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.